evening and we do apologize for some slight delay. We really have uh, here experts from different countries, uh, um, Slovenia, the United States, Czech Republic. So we will listen to your questions and we will try to answer. Pure cannabis from Nepal, uh, for your information. This is uh, uh, my head cover. Cannabis is not only um, the medicine, but it is also fiber the, that can be used for clothing. So any questions you would have, uh, uh, technical, um, the recreational, medicinal, we will try to find one of us who will be um, the, the expert to answer it. Mr. Meislik, in Czech. Good evening. I have a question um, to you like this. How does uh, police uh, and uh, uh, justice in Israel respond uh, or treat cases when somebody would grow the plant uh, himself for his own um, need that is simply um, the you can prove it's for you. I know that uh, you can get it uh, in the, um, the pharmacies. Uh, well, in Israel, 10 years ago, cannabis was uh, authorized for uh, treatment and uh, uh, five patients were uh, authorized to grow cannabis for themselves. And then they would grow it not only for themselves, but also for other patients. And um, when ultimately they were unable to cover all of the needs, uh, um, we developed the community of those who grew it for others. Uh, initial 10 years, it was all free of charge. They grew it and gave the harvest to Ministry of um, the Health. And the growing process is far from easy and cheap. And only when there were many patients, uh, they started to pay 370 shekels, doesn't matter whether you take 20 or 200 grams, you pay that you need it. And uh, it's about 10% of low um, the pension, something like 900 crowns for a Czech patient in this country, which is uh, um, the acceptable and adequate. And also it is quantity which uh, the means uh, that the grower has specific number of patients, uh, he has his cost covered, and uh, he would get some profit. He doesn't have to go to the black market uh, because he would lose the prestige and credit and would be no longer be a grower. So he's happy with uh, his uh, patients, uh, and also he advises the patient on how to use uh, um, the variety. And if one doesn't uh, succeed, he would um, offer another one. And often the grower is happy because he is helping, because many of the, um, the growers uh, are often religiously conscientious people and they take it as their duty. In Israel, like I said, Jews help one another. There are parts of the world where it is not uh, usual the, to help one another. But the Jews uh, really um, the help those in need, the weak ones. Uh, and it works so well that nobody has to solve it as a problem. I said it in my lecture, namely that patients uh, sometimes get uh, um, the little the, through the, um, the standard sources and uh, you have to grow it and they have to grow it yourself. But uh, Mr. Meislik, uh, five started uh, and they grew it uh, themselves uh, and they were authorized to do it uh, for five years till this year. And this year the, uh, the authorization was withdrawn. Cannabis uh, is illegal drug in Israel, but if you would uh, grow it, uh, then you run the risk of imprisonment of maximum 20 years. If uh, 
uh, you would uh, sell it to somebody uh, below uh, 18 years of age. Uh, your maximum jail sentence is 25 years. Nobody, therefore, would take the risk. There is uh, some black market. Uh, partly for patients, uh, like uh, I said, uh, that uh, many prepare extracts for the patients, and they do this really um, as a help. And then um, cannabis for recreational use, which is punished uh, for a sentence of 20 up to 25 years. So. It's much stricter than in this country or other countries. Think of how sick a person mentally has to be to go to another human being and say, because you're using this plant that I don't approve of, I'm going to put you in jail for 20 years. Think of what you would be like for you to go to another person and do that. It's mental illness. Um, I have a question. Um, there is a lot of practice uh, and also, of course, uh, the theory uh, that supports that practice that um, m the more the cannabinoids, especially THC, uh, the better uh, we can treat the disease, especially uh, I'm now uh, talking about cancer. Um, but um, last month, um, I got a, some paper from my friend who was in, in Israel on a conference. And he said to me that now they were kind of discovering that the best uh, treatment for cancer is 50-50 relations for THC and CBD. So my question is, uh, because in practice we have a lot of proof that um, high THC and low uh, CBD uh, that cured the cancer. Uh, and my question is, is this uh, information uh, um, maybe not true that I got it? Uh, or, I mean, is it the quantity that heals or is it the relations for THC and CBD or is it both? Because this is very important. Uh, also on this uh, paper, there was a, a ratio for, for epilepsy and it says seven uh, to one, which means seven CBD, one THC. So what's your opinion about all that? You cannot generalize because uh, each patient is different. And uh, as I said, what helps to one doesn't help to the other and just opposite. That is why we must do our best to find for a particular patient uh, the best uh, solution, the best strain which helps just to this particular patient. So the situation is, such, is not such easy because uh, patients uh, are different and sometimes strain which is necessary for these patients is not available. So sometimes growers must try several strains and find the correct strain for the particular patient. Because uh, if different patients have uh, the same disease, the same cancer, like cancer of lung, you know, two patients, cancer of lung, this can be two different cancers, you know. So it means that it doesn't mean that the same strain can treat both patients. What do you think, Bob? <laughs> Well, the plant itself is incredibly variable in terms of its cannabinoid, terpenes, and all of the goodies that constitute that plant. And likewise, humans are totally variable. And what you're looking for is an interface between the plant and the human being that's going to help restore health. And it's not something that's predictable. The reason there are strain shortages is because the governments have chosen to, to follow policies that make the people sick, die young, and die unhealthy. What we need is to free this, not medicine, this essential nutrient for modern man. If you want to live longer and you want to be healthy, you must consume cannabis on a regular basis. It's an anti-aging drug and it inhibits all age-related illnesses. Why does the government think they have the right to force us into any kind of regulation when it comes to growing in your backyard a plant that you need for your own health? Uh, 
maybe maybe one thing. This is actually the the fight that we are having everywhere. When you are discussing with uh, with the public uh, public uh, servants or you are discussing with with doctors, they said we need exact quantity, we need exact ratio, we need a well standardized issue, fine regulated. And this is a paradigm of, of, of cannabis. You cannot do this. It's so it's so individually it's so individual that you cannot prescribe exactly you need so many grams, so many of what. This is something that is really happening by walking or by running with with someone. And uh, uh, I really it's a question for the two of you how shall we address this? You know, the fact is that the strain which is good for one patient, as we said, is not good for the other one. And the amount which must use patient, what is not enough for one patient, is too much for the other one. So we must work with each particular patient and find for him the correct strain and the correct amount. You must understand this. That is why we every time start this particular strain with very small amount a week and we increase the amount and then patients must feel influence of this plant. As soon as he feels it, so he can tell you uh, if it's good for him or not. Experienced patients can tell you exactly. Unexperienced patients can explain to you what they feel, and you can, according to that, tell them if it's good or if them, they must change the strain. What do you think about that? Well, I'm not a scientist like a couple of these guys up here are, but uh, what I do is uh, talk to people all over the world, and I've coached probably a thousand plus patients to health. With seizures, generally what you hear is that CBD is what's needed. I echo what these gentlemen have said, that it really depends on the patient. Uh, there's a high-profile case of a little girl in the United States called Novali, who was born with part of her brain missing. She has hundreds of seizures. They tried CBD, and all it did was make it worse. When they got her on THC, the difference was phenomenal, and she's gone something like, 140, 150 days now without a seizure. It's really amazing. Uh, this little girl was blind. She couldn't sit. They said she would never show emotion. She would never talk. Well, this little girl can now see. She can sit. She's talking. The other day she said, Mama, and then she went, Hey, hey. And uh, it's just amazing the difference it's made. I know there's a lot of talk out there about uh, breast cancer, hormone-driven breast cancers, and whether it should be high THC or high CBD, and uh, the theory is uh, that high THC pushes the cancer sometimes in a hormone-driven breast cancer. Um, CBD became, became the new kid on the block, and uh, lately the patients that I've had contact with that had hormone-driven breast cancers I'm talking about 100, 150 cases where we did high CBD. And when I say high CBD, I'm talking about cannabis-derived uh, CBD, 60%. Uh, we haven't had one success with CBD alone. That doesn't mean it's not going to work. It's, that's just my experience with it. So again, it's really, really individual. Uh, Kids whose seizures are controlled with CBD very effectively, sometimes when they hit puberty, uh, the CBD f uh, fails to work anymore, and once they've added THC into the mix, their seizures are controlled. So it's all variables. Um, I think until we don't have method to determine the level of endocannabinoids in our body, it's very hard to determine also the dosage. But uh, the, as I understand, the endocannabinoids are in very low, uh, you know, uh, in the body. So it, that's uh, your work to determine how to, deter, uh, to figure out how to determine the level of endocannabinoids. Because until, until then, we don't actually know what we're doing. 
knowing the level of endocannabinoids is not really what's important here. What's important is that you're able to manipulate the very source of life with cannabis extracts. The very source of life is the food that we eat and specifically the carbohydrates versus the fats that we eat. Those are our major energy sources and they function completely the opposite. The carbohydrate burning promotes differentiation and the fat burning allows the cells to undergo what's called autophagy where they recycle their damaged pieces and then come out whole again. And when you have sugar burning cells that have kind of stretched their survivable limits, meaning they've developed ways of dealing with free radicals, then if you have ones that are sugar burners and caught in that mode and you force them into burning fat, then those cells die. And your CB1 allows cells to remain in the sugar burning mode, whereas your CB2 forces them into the fat burning mode. So if you haven't had chemo and radiation and you're having a, the chances are that initial cancer is a sugar burner. And when you give cannabis to that, the, you, have, you told me you have like an 85% success rate. That's way better than they're getting in the hospitals. <laughs> and you know, nobody's getting sick, people are getting healthier again. So the thing that's important is not what a doctor reads who doesn't ever use cannabis. He can never, you can never have a cannabis expert who doesn't use cannabis. I'm sorry, it makes no sense to me. So here's an expert who's treated lots of people and other experts who've helped people treat themselves. You see, that's what it's about. You give them the information and you get them the oil and they treat themselves. And if they don't like it, they don't do it or they try a different variable. There's so many routes and ways to accomplish this. And that's what everybody's individual responsibility is. Once they choose to go down this path, they have to find what works best for them. Indra Bayer. I think most everything has been said. From my perspective, I would like patients to work with high THC oils whenever it's possible. High CBD oils, okay for the beginning, for children or for cases where microdosing is all that is required. Otherwise, I would always like to see patients, especially cancer patients, uh, use high THC oils because I'm firmly convinced that THC is where the main magic is. As far as the other cannabinoids, we, we really know very little because now it's 144 cannabinoids that are known and 1,234 substances that can be isolated from cannabis. So what do we know? Now we're testing for 10 cannabinoids maybe and, and you know how variable the results from individual labs can be. So we don't even know how to test for it properly. So I would just say let's uh, stick with observational research you know let's get an idea of what it is but then it's really individual you don't know if they will eat a mandarin or an apple before taking the oil that will change the terpene balance and this and that so that's very individual uh, uh, the most important thing is how sedative the oil is, how well the patients will sleep when they eat the oil, and how comfortable they will feel. If they get euphoria, good sleep, and a big aphrodisiac effect, that's what I want them to have. And that's what high THC oils do, and CBD oils do not come close. That's all I know for now, okay? So, another question. Hello. <laughs> May I ask you something? Um, with the extraction process, how does um, temperature affect different um, parts of the, the medicine, as it were? So does, if it goes over a certain temperature, does it destroy things that we need, or does it need to be put at a certain temperature to release a different aspect of the THC? And um, what do you suggest with the extraction process as far as temperature goes, and, and a little bit, bit of an explanation?
today yeah. it's supposed to be decarboxylated extract. It means uh, that you in the fact in cannabis all these important cannabinoids are as acids and they are supposed to be decarboxylated because it's known that for cancer treatment THC or THC acid must be decarboxylated to THC. Unfortunately, we still don't have uh, enough knowledge concerning cannabinoid acids. And cannabinoid acids are very important for treatment, but uh, we have lack of any studies, and that is why today I used only decarboxylated compounds as CBD or THC. As I told you in my lecture, from 1950 to 1990, we used the extract of cannabis in a hospital in Olomouc in Czechoslovakia. And all these extracts were not decarboxylated. So the mostly there were cannabinoidic acids, not uh, neutral cannabinoids after decarboxylation. And this was very successful, so it means that we still have uh, a long way to understand all these compounds, how they can influence our health. We have only very particular knowledge concerning CBD and THC. You can uh, hear today also about CBG or THCV, CBDV, but this still is lack of uh, enough studies concerning these compounds. So we still are in the start of our research and it's very important, uh, as I said, cooperation of uh, analysts, uh, it means scientists, uh, patients and physicians. Do I have anything to say? I did a second ago, but I already forgot it. <laughs> so, Mr. question? Uh, I have a question. Um, if I have a situation that I have two different oils, one is very high THC oil for something about 98% of THC. And another oil is from about, I don't know, 80% of THC, but very high CBD, 10 and more CBD. What do you think? What is the better oil for the cancer? The high THC oil with 95 THC and low, very low CBD, maybe 1 or 2%, or the okay high level of THC, 85 maybe, and 10% of CBD. That is the first question. And the other, uh, second question is, what do you think? If I made the oil, to uh, cannabis extract, from the indoor plant and from the outdoor plant, what is the better medicine? And I really, really hope that you will give me the answer because this is very important to me because you know why, I'm, why, why am I asking? Thank you very much. The only thing that matters is what works. And I don't think you can predict in, in an individual case what's going to work. In general, I don't like pure THC. So if you have something that's very high THC, that means you're lower in other things. What's important is to make sure you have everything necessary. But I'd like to give just one example so people appreciate how, the na how our nature actually is. When, when I talk about flow-dependent structures and things that can perturb our biochemistry, because it, it, it addresses these questions when you understand what I'm trying to say. Every day, every one of your cells receives about 10,000 damages from free radicals that are made by your body every day. And you've got something like 15 trillion cells. So you're getting 15 trillion cells getting 20,000 damages a day. And one single damage in one single cell can kill you. If you had a free radical damage altering the expression of a gene that regulated cell division, and that cell started to divide uncontrollably, you have a cancer. And if your immune system couldn't see it and respond appropriately, and then you took chemo or cannabis or whatever else and it didn't work, you died from one molecule affecting you. So when people talk about strains and different amounts of this, that, and the other thing, it's the holistic impact of all of those things on your cells that matters. And that's why it's, it's potluck, so to speak. <laughs> no pun intended. No pun intended. So 
that's my thoughts. Another question. Hello. Um, <clears throat> I just had a question with regards to um, hormones. So, with regards to hormones, uh, from what I understand, that's the trigger for things like um, absorption and vitamin D. Um, is there any markers um, or any connection between taking, I don't know whether it's the CBD or the THC, and how does that impact the hormones and then how does that impact uh, vitamin D deficiency, which most of us are deficient, whether whatever your skin color origin. And the last second question is, is, is there any way at the moment or do you see a way in the future, just like you can test for your vitamin D level, then the future you'd be able to test for someone's CBD or THC level. Thank you. Vitamin D turns on fat burning. And as I've been saying, when cells are fat burning, they recycle their damaged pieces. They identify the damaged pieces because of the free radical induced changes in your DNA, your RNA, your proteins, your fats, your carbohydrates. And that initiates the repair process. And once the cell has got its act together again, then it can go on and do whatever it was supposed to do. So when you're looking, for example, when you're asking about hormones, well, hormones regulate your biochemistry. And for example, estrogen, which is so critical for a woman's health when she undergoes menopause, what happens? We know that she becomes susceptible to neurocognitive dysfunction, to cancers, to cardi you know, cardiovascular disease. Why is that? Because estrogen turns on fat burning. So that's always helping the cells to repurify themselves. That's what happens when you use, when you activate the CB2 receptor. And that's why cannabis has so many profound effects. And people typically talk of the CB2 receptor as like the immunological receptor. The truth is, wherever you have any pathology, wherever you have a cell in trouble, the CB2 receptor comes up. It's basically saying, give me some pot. Let me fix myself by turning on fat burning. So vitamin D turns on fat burning. There are a number of nutraceuticals that do that. And in general, we should be shifting more that way because the absurd policies promulgated by our governments told us if you want to not have heart disease, take fat-free foods. Well, guess what? The fats that you were eating and burning kept your heart good. When you only have carbohydrates, you turn into a pro-inflammatory mode and your cells try to protect themselves by turning it into fat. The same fat that clogs your arteries, things are backwards in the world. Okay, another question. Uh, there is one, uh, I think, a very important question for all the patients. Uh, uh, do you know, uh, do we have uh, some uh, data about uh, how the uh, suppositories, uh, oral taking or the inhalation, what is the uh, exactly the best model for intake uh, of cannabis? Uh, what is the uh, question? Uh, do we have data how uh, much uh, bioefficacy uh, of the oral taking uh, of the suppositories and how much is when we take, uh, when we mixed uh, uh, bio oil like cocos, uh, like uh, olive, uh, with uh, cannabis uh, decarboxylated extracts, uh, per, uh, especially with the THC extracts. So, do we have any real data that we can uh, take for our patients and our friends? Hello? Hello? Ah, okay. Of course, the best bioavailability is uh, per rectum, but uh, I think that uh, Bojo can answer because he has uh, good experience with uh, suppositories. 
the all available data are saying that the best bioavailability and absorption is through a rectal uh, uh, way. Uh, there is also a problem because uh, at uh, oral intake, some some part of CBD turns also, I think, to THC. And we don't know uh, how actually the gastric acid uh, affect the cannabinoids. Uh, our experience is that uh, the rectal suppository works uh, the best. And uh, as you see on my slide, I also took the slide from uh, Lumir's uh, lecture. When is exactly the bioavailability of the uh, oral intake, inhaling, or uh, rectal uh, intake? Okay. So, another question. Well, can I make a comment on that? Hello. I you know, but you should, when you're thinking about bioavailability, you should understand something. When you're smoking it, it goes right to your brain. When you eat it, it goes through your liver, and it gets converted to 11-hydroxy. And they have different effects. And when you take it rectally, people don't get high at all. So there's clearly significant differences and different biological effects that are going to come as a result of how you're taking it in. But in general, the important thing, especially with cancer, is get as much in as you can. <laughs> but don't do it orally all in one dose in the beginning. Start low if you're doing it orally. If you take too much, you'll never want to do it again. Whereas if you do it rectally, you can start with high doses. We, we have kids taking a few grams a day. Okay. I'd like to ask. Hello? Hello? Hi, I'd, I'd like to ask, uh, uh, how long does it take in uh, check conditions to decarboxylate by itself? Just uh, hanging up? If it takes like... Uh, weeks, years, and that's it. Decarboxylation is a question of temperature and question of the layer. So if you have oven and you want decarboxylate, ah, you think just uh, naturally. It depends if you keep it in dark or if you keep it in refrigerator or if you Dark, dark, dark. Of course, if you keep it dark, uh, it takes longer time for the carboxylation. More than a year, it can be. If you keep it in the refrigerator, maybe it's two years. If you keep it in the refrigerator, uh, uh, just air condition, you know. Evacuate it. It can be just different story. It depends on can, the con. Can be vacuum mist, like uh, in vacuum. Of course, if you vacuum it, these are special sex, but you put, uh, you have a bag like two meters high, you add a vacuum cleaner and you evacuate it, you close it, so it uh, shrinks and it becomes very small amount and you can keep it in a refrigerator. And still decarboxylated. No, 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 and, uh, and uh, it's not decarboxylated for a long time. But in that condition, in the vacuum stuff? Everything is... Uh, on how you keep it. If it's on the temperature of the intensity of light, of uh, evacuation, maybe you can, uh, before evacuation, uh, insert uh, nitrogen gas, so it uh, will be even better. So I cannot tell you just directly. Thanks very much. Ještě jsem se chtěl zeptat, jaký je váš názor na preventivní užívání konopí v určitých situacích. Mám na mysli třeba takové jarní období, nebo předjarní a jarní období vlastně přináší velké množství dýchacích problémů, angíny, jo, různé záněty dýchacích cest a tak dále. Ptám se proto, že, jak víte, moje dcera bere to konopí už dlouhodobě, a vlastně u ní se nikdy nestalo, že by onemocnila nějakými respiračními chorobami, když byla u nás, přestože já i manželka jsme byli nachlazení, kašlali jsme, smrkali jsme, bylo to hrozné, ale dcera ta mezi náma prostě proplouvala bez jakéhokoliv zás, teoto, že by se to jí dotklo. 
A naopak někdy, když sama říkala, že ji začínáš krábat v krku, tak to vyřešila tím, že si dala jednoho jointa navíc. A doopravdy to pomohlo. Tak právě proto se ptám, jaký je váš názor tady na toto. Děkuji. Pane Majzliku, tak můj soukromý názor, jako já samozřejmě dáme možnost i dalším tady hovořit. Já si myslím, že konopí je lék, a proto ho nebudu užívat preventivně. Já neužívám preventivně vitamíny. To je úplná blbost, když někdo kupuje multivitamíny a e, užívá to, to je naprostý nesmysl. Hrači to užívejte v přírodních dávkách a ne jako v syntetických dávkách. A jakýkoliv lék, když užíváte preventivně, tak snižujete jeho účinek. Potom je těžší pro ten lék, aby zapůsobil. Samozřejmě může být ta zkušenost vaší dcery, že jako to na ní působí jako blahodárně. Ovšem může v tom být i, že ona má lepší genetiku než vy nebo vaše žena, že je odolnější. To jako my nemůžeme ani, ani potvrdit, ani vyvrátit. A tak já budu rád, když tady někdo další jako řekne svůj názor, ale já bych řekl takto, já bych konopí preventivně neužíval, protože když jsem zdravý, tak nechám, aby pracoval endokanabinoidní systém. Protože když jsem zdravý, tak endokanabinoidní systém pracuje v pořádku. I of course disagree. <laughs> you know, for, for the same reason that we're able to completely control HIV by using cannabis, high doses of cannabis, we're also able to control a variety of herpes viruses, including the one that causes Kaposi sarcoma. So these are deadly diseases that are caused by the ability of a virus to replicate in the cell. And again, the viruses have evolved when we've evolved to use more and more of our sophisticated sugar burning pathways. And when you force them into a different metabolic environment, that of fat burning, they can't adapt to that. You see, viruses have, they need the cellular machinery activated because they're trying to have the cell manufacture a lot of viruses. So that means they're using a lot of energy. And that typically is going to create free radicals that would then impair that process. They would feed back and inhibit that process, or the cell would die. So viruses typically carry into the cell with them enzymes, proteins, that allow them to infect the cell by, and not have the cell make so many free radicals that it dies. So they're in this kind of stress state. And when you turn on fat burning, they can't adapt and they die. Uh, my friend, for example, with HIV, when he was first starting to use these high doses, he was concerned, he was living in the Bronx, and this was the year of the uh, influenza epidemic that they had, and everybody was concerned. And I said, don't worry about it. You're using enough cannabis right now that the way that virus, the influenza virus, replicates, it's not going to be very happy doing it. And I knew that from my own experience. I used to smoke, and if I, if I smoked when I had a, an influenza-type infection, it would make it so much worse. And I learned never, I never would smoke when I had it. But then I found out by accident, I was eating some, and I wound up with the flu. And I had the mildest case of the flu, about as mild, it was milder than if you get a flu vaccine. So that confirmed to me, you have to look at what goes on in your body. You have to start to learn to understand what's going on. But you can control viral and bacterial infections by controlling the things that they need to live. And you can do that in a healthy way. That's why ketogenic diets have become so prevalent right now, because people get healthier by going on them. We used to naturally consume more polyunsaturated fats in our diet than we do now. The ratio of omega-3s to omega-6s was totally different 100 years ago, even in the meat that we ate. So things have changed and we are responding with our illnesses to the lack of understanding that you are what you eat and cannabis is part of what you need to eat. So anybody else want to share experience? Would you say, uh, do you think it should be used as a prevention? Um, 
from from my point of view, cannabis certainly should be used as a pre preventative medicine, and yes, it should be given to children wherever there is a need. If anyone with herpes virus, uh, a ch child contracts a herpes virus when it's one year old, wh what else are you gonna do with it? How are you going to keep the uh, virus, uh, uh, herpes virus, uh, uh, under control if, if not with cannabis? So, uh, from my point of view, of course, uh, cannabis oil should be preferably in everything that comes into contact with skin. So, it should be in most or all cosmetic products, etc. And yes, of course, children should be using these cosmetic products for rashes and everything, mosquito bites. So I'm not afraid of, of having uh, of having children have uh, cannabinoids in their blood because I think it's very beneficial for them. So whoever thinks it's good for them to use cannabis and cannabis oil products as a prevention, I'm more than okay with that. I'm very happy about it. Okay. Uh, uh, I know few people who uh, took cannabis on a prevention basis. Uh, one of uh, them is here. He took the all uh, 60 gram uh, uh, therapy. But also in Slovenia, many people are deciding to uh, take uh, preventionally, and the results are also okay. People don't get sick. Uh, people don't get uh, influenza. I don't know. Uh, I think it's uh, from big benefit if you take cannabis uh, preventionally. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Bojo, for making 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 it public. Um, I, I I must say that I completely agree what, with what Bob said about you have and, and Indrik as well. You have to listen to your body and listen to what works fine for you. I am not a, a big user of, of cannabis. I compared to some of the people around the table who are really truck drivers, they have a lot of cannabis with them and uh, everywhere. I am a more uh, uh, bicycle, uh, bicycle man. I'm, I'm not smoking joints, actually. I smoke with my va vaporizer. And uh, I can tell you a small, small quantity, but whenever I'm smoking, it's a good trip. It's really a good trip. I like the riding the bicycle. But what I learned, what I learned lately is uh, uh, if you start a day with a small amount of CBD and then during the day go to a, a, a web, web with a lot of THC, it's beautiful. It stays and you, you never get the overload. So this is my experience, but I, I, cannot, I cannot say this is experience of everybody else. So. As a governmental man, this is maximum that I can say, because otherwise I will... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... You heard experiences of different persons. So, another question, lady, here? Prime, dobry večer. Hovorí sa tu o ťažkých ochoreniach o rakovine. Mám takú otázku. Ľudstvo je témer pohlčené epidémiou hepatitídy, vírusu C. Aké máte skúsenosti pri tejto liečbe? Farmaceutické spoločnosti síce vyvinuli mnoho liekov, ktoré sú mnohokrát aj neúčinné. Čo vy na to? Ďakujem. Somebody wants to... Well, this is an example where the pharmaceutical companies have truly come up with something that's very functional. So the people with hepatitis C that had previously, in general, not been able to be successfully treated, they have an incredibly high success rate with it. But they charge something like $100,000 for the treatment. Now, I know of specific examples where people had hep C, did the high-dose cannabis, and are now free of hep C. So I don't know 
how often that works, but I know it can work. And it's the same kind of a story, because you're, again, you're dealing with a viral infection and how that virus powers its own replication and how cannabis influences the energy sources that it needs. I know that a few of my people have hep C and I think of the 10 that I can think of off the top of my head, uh, eight of them are clear of hep C and two of them are well on their way. Uh, one individual it took a long time, over a year. Uh, the least amount of time it took was two months with another individual. So yet again, it's such an individual thing. Question? Dobrý večer, ja by som mal ešte otázku, že ktoré vážne choroby dokážeme pomocou konopí vyliečiť úplne a ktoré choroby dokážeme len tak zmierňovať príznaky? Vieme, že klasické medikamenty, klasické lieky pri tých vážnych chorobách hej, pacientom, pacientom iba zmierňujú príznaky a úplne ich nevyliečia. Tak moja otázka, ktoré tieto vážne choroby dokáže konope vyliečiť úplne? Uh, we have a very good experience with all autoimmune diseases from autism till cancer because uh, if you know the way how cannabis works in your body then we know also why cannabis helps with so wide uh, variety of uh, conditions. Um. I've seen so many different things healed with cannabis. I always say, show me a disease condition. This doesn't at least help. Um, everything from cancer, hep C. Had a little girl in the States who had really brittle uh, bones from radiation and she had a fracture that wouldn't heal and they were going to amputate her leg at the hip. She was only five years old. They had slated her for surgery. We got her on high THC at night, high CBD in the daytime and that fracture healed in two weeks. I've had kids with autism who have been completely nonverbal for four years start talking within a couple of weeks. So, you know, you name the disease condition and cannabis helps. Again, it regulates everything in your body from conception until death. We are holistic organisms. Everything in your body interacts with everything else. And cannabis, by virtue of regulating everything in your body, is a unique way to manipulate everything simultaneously in a holistic manner. Cannabis cures people not by killing the bugs, but by making you healthier so that you're not providing the environment that the bug needed. And that's occurring through this metabolic manipulation. More questions? Yes, hello. Do you have any experience with Alzheimer? Well, I can tell you again, Alzheimer is caused by pro-inflammatory biochemistry, meaning again, sugar burning, and not having sufficient autophagy, meaning recycling. So these particular proteins that form the amyloid plaques and the neurofibrillar tangles, those are things that could have been eaten up as they were being formed if you were living with a different biochemical environment rather than having such a pro-inflammatory imbalance by excess carbohydrate consumption. It's the same story everywhere and it always is true and tons of science verifies it everywhere. Uh I've had a couple of uh, Alzheimer's patients. One that comes to mind was um, a woman in the UK whose mom was in a home. She uh, didn't recognize her daughter. She couldn't dress herself. She was really, really gone. And this particular lady started her mom on high THC cannabis oil and coconut oil. I think it was about, I want to say six months and her mom was able to move back home with her, feed herself, dress herself, uh, ended up going out to Silver Threads every night, it was like completely functioning again.
It was quite a miraculous turnaround. Uh, we have also experience with uh, many neuro neurological diseases from uh, ALS to PSP to Parkinson's or Alzheimer. Uh, two years, no, yes, two years ago on the fair Ljubljana, uh, Ljubljana fair, nature and health. It was a guy from Sweden with PSP, very severe. He couldn't walk, he couldn't talk, and after a week on the suppositories, he started to walk and talk and eat by himself again. Uh, we have a lady with ALS who is growing for herself for two years now. Uh, her symptoms were from uh, March till June very severe, so she hardly can move. Now she still grows for herself uh, in two years. And uh, if we consider uh, official medicine and the ALS, we know what is the prognosis. You know, the thing that's important to remember is that cannabis via the CB2 receptor promotes neuroregeneration. So whether you're looking at Alzheimer's disease or any of these other neurological disorders, they're typically the result of neurons dying. And it's through the cannabinoid system, the CB2, expanding the, the neuro, the promoting neurogenesis of the, both the stem cells and the CB1 then allowing for their differentiation that allows for the replacement. And that's why you can have these miraculous effects. This is also why it's excellent for people with strokes, for example. Um, yes, actually, that's, that's what happened to my mother. When my, when my brother died of uh, lung cancer, she actually got a brain stroke. And the effects, uh, what you saw, were literally like a dementia in combination with Parkinson. So from the beginning, they, they didn't know what really happened to her. And I gave her uh, uh, the oil. And the funny thing is that when I spoke to her, she either didn't recognize me or she thought that I'm her brother, not her son. But when she got small amount of oil in, 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 uh, as a suppository, or even under the tongue, she, the tremor stopped. And she was able to formulate a few sentences speaking to me, and then falling again in the darkness. This is the, the, the issue. I, ex I explain this issue, why we need to get with the cannabis in the elderly houses, because this is really where we can show very quickly improvements because of pain those people have, because of the depression, because they feel useless, because of all, all the medicaments that make them dumb. And uh, uh, actually, I think if you, this is one of the ways to reintegrate the uh, elderly people back to society. They take care, like they take care of the, of the grandchildren, they can take care of the plants, they can speak between themselves, they can speak to the nurses, they can speak to the doctors. Suddenly, suddenly, I'm sure we can see smilings in the elderly houses. Okay. okay. Please, could you say more about the possible conversion from CBD into THC by the, the stomach acid? The publication which appeared recently, this is just, these are just artificial conditions. It's nothing natural, it cannot happen in your stomach. The answer you know very simply. Eat some T CBD, do you get high? No. Eat some CBD and then some THC, does it inhibit the high? Yes. So the answer we all know for anybody who's ever used it. Again, experts who's never used it. Because the conditions which are used in these publications, just your uh, cannabis doesn't stay so long time in your stomach. Of course, if you have artifact, you can change CBD to THC in the lab. You can change THC to CBD in the lab. But what you can read on internet about these changes that you can change CBD to THC is not true. You know, this is the problem of internet that 
sometimes you can read something what is not real and it influenced many persons because they believe what is written. They said, oh, it was on internet, so it must be true. But it's not true. You must be careful. Um, hi, I'd like to know whether you have any data, and if you don't have any data, based on your experience, um, what's the success rate of treating cancer patients with high THC oils? And also, how do you assess when such treatment has been successful? Um, for example, if the cancer markers go down, is that a sign or is that a, in itself enough? How do you basically assess that the treatment was successful? Thank you. Patient with correct genes, which correct strain, can treat cancer fully. This is my answer. Skin cancer provides a nice way of examining what goes on with cannabis because you can visually see it. You got a cancer in front of you. And I can tell you unambiguously with basal cell carcinomas, you put on the oil and within anywhere from three days, to three weeks, they fall off and they're gone. Now it's quite interesting because if you do the same thing with squamous cell carcinomas, they grow and they grow and they grow and scares the hell out of you and eventually they go away, they rot, so they, they die differently, they die by autophagy because the whole thing turns into a black necrotic mass I'm surprised I didn't show those videos. Anyway, it turns into a black necrotic mess that stinks. And then it, it heals up and it's completely gone. But that can take like months. And what we recently found out, is a lady friend of mine who had been treating her family and herself, they grew up on, you know, on a sugarcane farm in Australia. So you have fair-skinned limeys that went to the equator and said, give me cancer. And they all got it, the brothers, sisters, mother, father, everybody's got it. So she had repeatedly had uh, uh, basal cells and she would treat them and it becomes like nothing, you know. So I got another cancer, all right, put cannabis oil, it goes away. And this time she had this little dot on her nose and she was sure it was, you know, another cancer. So we put it on it and then what does it do? It starts to grow and it grows, and it grows, and she's walking around with this marble on her nose. It was literally, a, you know, black oil, too, so it was a big black marble. And she's a very attractive woman and a model. I was amazed that she was walking around like that, and I'm freaking out, because this thing keeps growing and growing. So based on the things that I've explained about free radicals, I knew she needed a burst of free radicals. I said, Jackie, I can't stand it anymore. Take some hydrogen peroxide and put it on there. And within hours, the whole thing shriveled up, rotted, and started to fall off, and then fell off, healed completely, no scar, you can't even tell us anything happened. So these are the kinds of things that happen within us, you know? And it presents different problems in different cases. For example, I know of two people, one with colon cancer and one with stomach cancer, where they swore to me, they, Bob, you're not gonna believe this, but I shit out my tumor, I saw it in the toilet. <laughs> Well, if you think about it, you know, that's on the inside of the tube. And if you're killing it, it, it comes out. On the other hand, I knew somebody with uh, lung cancer and was getting very successful results in terms of how she felt and what she could do. But eventually, what happened is she developed a pneumothorax. You know, it, it, it was probably right by the wall there. So as the cancer died, you know, she developed a pneumothorax, and she went to the doctor for that. They told her, listen, we got to operate and fix that. But she was so intensely insane about the doctors because they gave her such a hassle about not taking chemo and doing cannabis that she wouldn't go, and she wound up dying three days later from a pneumothorax despite the fact that she was curing her cancer. <laughs> Lots of crazy stories. You know, from uh, our department in Jerusalem, there was wonderful scientist, Dr. Esther Friede, very healthy person. I shared with her office several years. 
healthy person every year she ran uh, Jerusalem marathon she never smoked she was 100 percent healthy and one day cancer of lungs she had anything available any strain any THC any CBD anything nothing helped her she died from cancer How much did she take? She took anything what she wanted when she felt comfortable. No, no, but if you, you have to take enough or it doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> and another lady, another lady from our institute, she prepared, uh, she purified THC for patients and she became cancer patient and they prescribed her cookies. She took one small part of cookie and she was two days finished and she said never ever any more cannabis. So these are two examples for our department when it didn't work. It works perfect, it, work, it can heal cancer 100%, but sometimes it doesn't work. It's not going to work if you don't take enough, that's absolutely for sure. And if a person tries it orally and freaks out because they took whatever too much was, and there's no magic number, it might be one drag on a joint for one person, and it might be eating a half a gram for another person. But the point is, if you don't take enough, it's not going to work. Um, addressing how you gauge whether or not it's been successful, I can only speak for myself. Um, Usually when I gauge it successful is when they come back from the doctor and they've had that biopsy or that CEA, you know, carcinogenic estimated assay test that says they're clear. I recommend that the patient try and ingest uh, 60 grams in 90 days. Um, and that's just a guideline. I always tell people don't make yourself crazy over it because I lost a lot of sleep worrying about that. Um, and I also suggest to people that they start out really small orally and, uh, you know, if they're, if they're like young moms or people who really need to be on their game, they can't be walking around stone. They're still trying to do their life and fight for their life. So I'll suggest to them that they do uh, suppositories in the daytime and do it orally at night. Um, I'm a firm believer in doing both orally and rectally, so you kind of cover all your bases. Hope that answers your question a bit. Uh, so I think you ask also percentage. Uh, let's say 70 plus percent and more chemo you have before, missing sooner you go and less chemo you have, you will be healthy earlier. That's my experience. I'd say we have about, in the cases that I've, I've dealt with, an 80 to 85 percent success rate. Um, certainly the people who've had chemo and radiation, the, the battle tends to be a lot tougher. So for, that, for that rate, what type of extracts have you used? Because I know, you, Beaujou, you've been using organic solvent, naphtha type extracts. What kind of extracts have you been using? Um, high THC usually, um, what solvent? Bu uh, butane and um, uh, a lot of people that I point towards a particular individual, she does... Uh, uh, Everclear alcohol. Yeah. So any of these methods can work. What you want to make sure is that the starting material is not containing pesticides that are going to then potentially concentrate with the solvent extractions and the evaporation. So good organic cannabis should be what everybody has available. That's why you should grow it in your own garden for free, like it's available. Maybe Bojo forgot to tell you, we, we made the statistics according to different cases, different cancers, leukemia and so on. And uh, these statistics at the time, I think it's uh, less than 400 patients that we had. And we, we were very, he was very, very precise to give also the information about non-success. This is something that you will never get uh, in the oncology. They said if, you, if, you, if they are successful, it's successful, they've been successful because of chemotherapy and because of radiation. But if you die, you die because of the illness. This is why the, this is why the statistic of the, of the, of the oncologies are, are really uh, uh, useless. 
while uh, uh, the, the statistics that we had show that very good results, he was speaking about glioblastoma, I think the worst result we have with the breast cancer, I think. Uh, my experience is one of the worst uh, cancer or kidney cancer. I don't know why, but they don't respond very well uh, to this treatment. I don't know if you're... But uh, the easiest is uh, actually the breast cancer and the glioblastomas or other gliomas. But we have everything from small cell lung cancer to adenocarcinoma of lungs, of pancreas, of everything. And still, less therapy is better for you. Um, one of the cancers that I think is the easiest to clear is leukemia. Um, we're really, really successful with that. Um, I've actually had uh, success with kidney cancer. I had one gentleman who was given uh, two months to live and we cleared him in three months. So again, you know, it's an individual thing. I'd like to know from both of you, how successful you've been, or three of you, with um, pancreatic cancer. Because, you know, pancreatic cancer, conventional treatment's 4%, so it's, those are probably misdiagnoses. But from what I've heard, it's been quite the opposite with cannabis, so I'd like to get a broader sampling. Um, I, I, again, can only talk about cases I've been involved with, um, and I've seen quite a few successes, and I'm talking stage four metastasized pancreatic cancer. I can think of two off the top of my head. One, one gentleman, when I talked to him, it was actually Christmas Eve, so I remember it very clearly, and he was in New York City, and he had stage four uh, pancreatic cancer, and I remember thinking to myself, this is totally a palliative situation. And he phoned me three months later, and he was completely cancer-free. So, there you go. Failures versus successes. Um, I think I've had two failures, but as Ginger just said, there's never a failure. Um, one thing that I want to address is, you know, we're all going to die someday, and the oil doesn't work all the time. It works, in, as I said, in my estimation, 80 to 85% of the time. What I can say is, without exception, every single case where we have lost a person, the family, a friend, whoever has said what a difference the oil made to that person's quality of life right up to the end. Uh, uh, success rate for pancreatic cancer, uh, I don't know about the rate. We only work with anecdotal evidence, so it's uh, 10, 10, 20, 30 cases. For, for pancreatic, uh, I have, I think, 25 testimonials. Uh, most of them did well. Uh, I have helped, uh, I think, three patients uh, who were for, were with pancreatic cancer. Uh, one of them tried to combine it with chemo, and he died of the side effects of the chemo because it burned to the top of, of his bowels, and after that he died. The other three are still alive. So even for pancreatic cancer, we're having some success. It's n it is not an elixir of immortality, that's for sure. But you know, you know, it will always help to some degree if it's used properly. I cannot imagine anyone who's not allergic to cannabis who would not benefit from using it. You know, topically, uh, that's one thing we didn't get to. A full spectrum attack always works best. So you, you want the patients preferably to eat the oil, to take suppositories, to use it topically, and to vape it for mood control. Later on, doctors will start using uh, drips and, and controlled coma that we've been talking about. They'll put me in a coma and wake me up when I'm healthy again a month later. Uh, from what we know from Bob's friend, it is safe or it might be safe to ingest 50 grams of the oil at one sitting. Maybe if you would like to tell us about that because it's amazing. He's done it on two different occasions. 
the guy is a scientist and he goes to meetings. He's also an HIV activist and he's had HIV for um, 26 years or so now. And when I met him, I don't know if it's five years ago, something to that effect, he was fully resistant again to all of the drugs that were out there. And he's a very special, intelligent person, 189 IQ, totally out there. And so we were in Washington lobbying to make new biotech companies to get funding so that they could generate new drugs because he was resistant. That's the kind of character we're talking about. I have a cramp. Oh. So anyway, we're in Washington, and he comes down with a Carposi sarcoma because he was resistant and his immune system failed. And I said, here, put this on. And he was very reluctant because among a million other things, he's a pastor at a Saddleback Church. He's also a uh, patched hell's angel among a million other things. So he puts it on, and I go back to Colorado at the time, and he goes back to New York, and three days later, I get a phone call. He goes, Bob, what the fuck is going on here? I'm holding a Carposi in my hand. They're not supposed to fall off. And he subsequently, part of our involvement with cannabis science was in Amsterdam, and he was getting incredible workups. The, the, the Dutch healthcare system is amazing, because he was just living there for business, and they were taking a hundred times better care than he was getting as a veteran in the United States. And they were doing this full analysis. We actually knew the mutations that were occurring in, his D in, in the HIV virus as a function of the cannabis treatment. Unfortunately, the entire research team, including the head, Yap Long, was in that plane that was shot down over the Ukraine on their way to the HIV meeting. So we lost all of our data. But this guy is still going on now for years. He has an undetectable viral load, even with a spinal tap. He's got normal T cell levels. And it took two years, but he finally got rid of the hump on his back and the dyslipidemia in his stomach. And he's, he's healthy as a horse. But he does a gram a day. But when he was traveling and he came down recently with 16 carposes, he came home and he took 50 grams of oil. And then he goes into like an insane place for a few days and eventually recovers. And by then they've fallen off because they're very, very painful when they fall off. You can put it on topically. And it, it literally, I, he hasn't sent me the video. I'm pissed at him. But he's got a video where when he puts the oil right on the carposi, it starts to bubble, which tells me that the immune cells are spitting out free radicals and killing this whole system. It's very, very interesting. I want the video. <laughs> okay, next question. Prosím vás, prosím vás. Eh, tady už bylo skoro všechno řečeno. Eh, já jsem se chtěla ještě zeptat eh, na těžkou osteoporózu. Těžkou, velmi těžkou. Your bones are made when your cells are in the fat burning mode. You know, the kind of a simple way to understand it is calcium activates everything and it gets withdrawn in different storage areas, including your bones, when you're in the fat burning mode because you're not using the calcium to activate all of the things that cause the free radicals that make you then stop doing it. <laughs> so, cannabis is what women should be using once they lose the fat burning protection of estrogen. So other nutraceuticals, resveratrol, vitamin D, polyunsaturated fatty acids, and cannabis, all of those things will reverse the effects of losing the estrogen. So there was one question. Yeah, yeah. Oh, in green, in green. Hello, uh, thank you for your knowledge. I have one question because uh, as Mr. in the middle said, you need a lot of cannabis, a lot of oil in your body, but these things uh, are not really cheap. So in some countries it is possible to grow, in some countries there is not. But the question is when, when money comes in, different interests come and so on, 
So what would be uh, for you question, Mr. On the right, you said you are a governmental, you have some, I don't know, you, you know, what is the best uh, medicines that this treatment with cannabis becomes more available to all the people? So it's not so uh, so much expensive, and then and that the some interest from the corporate uh, world don't come in too fast to ruin and to just expense the thing that now costs I don't know twenty to one hundred. Yes. Yes. Thank you for for this question. Actually, this is uh, this is why uh, activists we don't like the wording medical cannabis. Because medical cannabis means that the big pharma is looking for a channel to sell again something that they don't have, that they, are, they don't know. Because this is a plant that, is, that has been on this planet for a long time. And uh, if you ask me what's the best, uh, the best way to, went, to go through all this uh, the cheapest possible way is that you grow your own plants, that you have your own garden, that you make your own oil, and if you need some help, there should be activists who, are, who can help you how to make the, the, the proper oil. And, uh, uh, and, and down on this road, I think every, everyone has to learn. Doctors, uh, uh, patients, nurses, they have to learn how to, how to modulate this. Uh, I don't, I'm, don't feel very positive about buying, uh, buying the, the cannabis, the flour, or the oil in, in pharmacies. I think this, this, will, this will bring prices very, very high. Uh, my opinion is what is, what is the ratio now between, between what is expected and what the black market has is... Yep, I don't know. Maybe. Uh, let it put this way. In Slovenia, the prices on the black market are anything between 30 and 100 euro a gram. The prices in pharmacy is uh, 240 euro a gram in, uh, in a pharmacy. So it's, this is much more expensive. But you can still grow by yourself. First is you and your health, and then uh, is uh, 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 government and law and whatever. Uh, you have to know that growing cannabis for horticultural purposes is not against any law, because it's excluded from the uh, convention from 61. And so we, in Slovenia, we make courses, we teach people how to, how to grow, uh, we process for them because if you go grow by yourself, there is no black market and there is no pharmacy. You can grow your own medicine. Uh, but we don't like the idea uh, that uh, people process, or I don't like this idea at home. I told on my lecture, it's volatile, it's uh, poisonous, it's dangerous for people. So my idea is to establish small local labs where people can bring their product you know, green material, and they leave with end product. And uh, I hope we'll achieve this. And in this case, the medicine will be almost for free. That's exactly what needs to be done. The plant has to be free. But on the other end, we, I'm involved in a very large grow in Washington State. And right now, we can wholesale oil at $10 a gram. And we're hoping to get our cost eventually down to about a dollar a gram. So once there's enough people producing it in an economical fashion, and of course that would be driven if we could all grow our own in our own garden, <laughs> the, the prices would just be trivial. And if people want, then they can go and buy it. You know, the, prohibition has created a very interesting circumstance that I'm very excited about. What we've seen in the United States, in Colorado, for example, is that something like a $120 million reduction in federal health care costs since cannabis legalization. What that means is that a population within that state is not taking the free poisonous medicine. 
that is officially sanctioned across the country, the pharmaceutical, but rather is using the state legal medicine of cannabis. And they'd rather pay out of their pockets to get something that works than to take poison for free. And that same kind of logic we're seeing in that, for example, there's lower levels of diabetes in people who use cannabis. There's lower levels of bladder cancer. So all of the things that we've been discussing are fundamental truths that will manifest themselves. So what the government has unknowingly done is they've created a national experiment. So the backward-looking people who are against cannabis will stay in the conventional pharmaceutical route. And the more open-minded people, the people of the future, will be living longer, living healthier, and costing less. And eventually, the absurdity of what's going on will be undeniable. So thank you, government. Thank you, prohibition, because now you've shot yourself and you're too dumb to know it. Hello, um, I've got a question uh, with regards to um, two, two of the most, um, two of the philosophies where cannabis was used for thousands of years. So you have Chinese or Oriental medicine and Ayurvedic medicine, which is Indian medicine. And for years I was always trying to find, uh, because all this stuff has been written in the scriptures for thousands of years, but according to Western medicine, scientifically proven medicine is not going to recognize scriptures from anything beyond 100 years ago. And then there's the other side that in Ayurvedic medicine and also Chinese, it says that whatever herb you take is going to be a different amount for one person, i.e. me, and it's going to be maybe more or less for another individual. And this is what... Um, all of you on the panel have been saying that it's according to the individual and this is also what the pharmaceutical industry is also heading down the path of nanomedicine. My question is, is that all this customized uh, medicine thinking has already been prevalent and already been mentioned for thousands of years in these old philosophies. What is the conversation and where is the conversation happening with the medicinal doctors or the people from these philosophies. I've spoken to Chinese doctors, Indian doctors, and a lot of them have not studied. I mean, they've studied it in scriptures, but they just then bypass it. Is there any conversation happening? And is, there, is, is it feasible to have some Indian Chinese doctor who's studying natural medicines at another conference on cannabis to offer their insight? What, what do you think of that? Doctors that I've met that practice alternative medicines are fully in line with using cannabis. I've been a professor at the University of Vermont, the University of Colorado, New York Medical School, so all three places with medical schools. And when I go and I try to talk with doctors and scientists about the things I'm talking to you about, they can't hear what I'm saying. They, I literally got kicked out of somebody's office recently after I talked about thermodynamics and stuff for 15 minutes and we were having this very interesting conversation and then I turned it into marijuana like I did today and he immediately said, you have to get leave my office now. His, his doctor is a wife and his wife is a doctor and they know what's true, you see, and I'm crazy. Hi. Um, when you have your patients come in with whatever disease they, they suffer from, do you suggest dietary um, changes and things in their diet? Do you think that's contribute to their good health or is that, um, I mean, it's pretty obvious once you talk to them that they're drinking coffee, eating McDonald's and drinking Coca-Cola, that that's not going to be a good thing. But have you done it with people that haven't changed their diet and people that have changed their diet or... What's kind of your general protocol? Uh, as Bob say, you are what you eat. And uh, your uh, way of life brings you to your troubles. And if you don't change anything, 
you don't you you cannot expect any changes so diet is very important uh, uh, beside the uh, cannabis and other uh, remedies when treating cancer the general instruction is that the food should be mostly vegetarian but i usually don't try to uh, tell people too much about what diet they should get on because I'm talking to seven billion people from different cultures so what am I to tell them what they should eat if they feel like having eating some meat every now and then even when they're eating the oil for for cancer I, I tell them well your body is telling you to eat some so go ahead and eat some don't eat too much of it you don't need overburned fat or something like that but if you feel like eating some meat every now and then, go for it. And uh, apart from that, I think it's really so individual that, that we will not have a proper answer to this. You know, Bob is uh, right about the fat burning and, and sugar burning aspect of it. But when you eat high doses of the oil, a gram or more, it burns sugar so quickly <laughs> that uh, I think sometimes even cancer patients will need to eat some honey just not, not to fall out of balance. You know, so my answer about diet is a little bit from everything, whatever the person, whatever makes the person happy. Of course, it should be more the so-called healthier food, but I would not r remove uh, meat from the diet completely if the person likes to eat it every now and then. What about specifically sugar? Do you tell people to stop eating sugar when they're cancerous? It's best to, to stay away from white sugar and fructose, of course, but honey if it's natural you know, every now and then a little bit I don't think it's going to hurt the patient you know, follow your body whatever your body tells you to eat eat it don't eat as uh, the oil usually will not let you eat as much as you used to eat before anyway so people by weight eat let's say one-third of what they used to eat before you know, but whatever they feel like juicing is okay but may, not everybody feels comfortable when they're on vegetarian diet only. Some people feel too anxious, that's not good. So really, that's, that's individual. What about? I have two diabetic friends, both overweight significantly, both in, had been injecting insulin, and they got on to high doses of cannabis. It looks like you need anywhere from, uh, for some people, maybe 100, but at least 200 milligrams will definitely put you in the fat-burning mode. And these people now are no longer using insulin for months. Their sugar levels are normal, and they continuously are losing weight in a very dramatic fashion. So this, again, is a very consistent picture here, and you are what you eat. And we used to eat a lot more fats and proteins than we do now. So reducing carbohydrates is the general trend if you want to stay healthy. And a big fad in the US, I don't know about here, is eating these ketogenic diets, which basically exclude carbohydrates. And you can test your piss and see if you're in ketosis. But that'll knock out inflammatory things. It'll knock out infections. It's all part of this holistic approach of learning and becoming healthier. Uh, I can tell you my experience with the food. If you are not sure, take a little oil, smoke a vap or a, or a joint, wait until you are a little high, and then start talking to the food. <laughs> you will choose what you need. What, what would you say about... Uh, In the fact, you can find many suggestions uh, what is healthy for you. I like a uh, book by Paul Breck, Miracle of Fasting, because fasting can save your life. And he also described how to return from fasting to regular food. And he suggested what is supposed a man to eat. But what I like at the end of his book, he said, what I suggested, this is good for me. Maybe it's not good for you. Each person must find what is good for his body. Because what is good for one body, it doesn't mean that it's good for another body. 
Have you have have you had any experience in with raw juice in cannabis? Juice in cannabis in the juice zone. Yes, but uh, there are a lot of people juicing cannabis in Slovenia, but uh, we don't uh, follow the effects actually. We know the uh, acids are anti-inflammatory. We speak before, we don't know if they bind or not, how they bind. So uh, it's very healthy, but uh, we don't know much data, at least I don't. I'm forgetting his last name. Bill uh, in California is very Bill big on Courtney. Courtney, right? Bill Courtney. He's very big on juicing. His wife had a variety of inflammatory related illnesses, eating wise, reproductive wise. They said she'd never have a kid. She's been juicing for years now, has two healthy kids. She herself is healthy. So again, there's profound benefit, I think, for all of us to consume cannabinoids in a variety of different fashions. You know, and, and different stages of the plant development, etc. It's just really rich in things that, in general, are good for us. And you know, to kind of push the concept further it, of, of this whole fat burning story, if you look into how most of the Chinese herbs and other herbal remedies work, they all wind up turning on fat burning. So, another question here. I've done juicing and it is very effective. I was an MS patient when I was 28, I'm 53 now. I've had bone cancer, breast cancer, all sorts of cancer, and I've had MS from when I was 28. And I can tell you from my experience that juicing cannabis, just put five or six leaves in your juice every day. Very, very good. Okay, I'll ask two, two short questions uh, regarding the oncology patients. Uh, I, I have a question regarding the low-grade glands, if you have any experience or research. And if you are uh, low-grade gliomes, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a type of tumor, it's, uh, the, this one is growing very, very slowly, but uh, it's impossible to get rid via chemotherapy or radiotherapy, if you have any experience of, about it. And the second question is just, uh, you are still talking about the oil, so th this is some kind of oil, like uh, it's presented uh, like Phoenix Tears, like Rick Simmons, or uh, what is the name? Yeah. Okay, thank you. For one answer. I, I didn't hear the first question, so I couldn't answer. Uh, Well, there was, I don't know if this is a direct answer to your question, but a paper just came out the other day where certain gliomas in young kids spontaneously regress. And what they found is that the ones that spontaneously regress have CB1 receptors on them. So their interpretation was that uh, more so than others, all right, more so than normal. So their interpretation was that the uh, CB1 receptor was allowing for the activity of the endocannabinoids to inhibit the cancer. I would take a very different approach based on the way I look at things. I would say that that was an early stage cancer that was still a sugar burning cancer and that's why the CB1 receptor was still on there. And because it was in an early stage like that, the immune system was able to deal with it. Whereas if it, they had treated it with chemo, for example, it would have converted into a fat burning one and then that would have killed the kid. Okay, so the last question, uh, it will be fast. Uh, uh, the lady there would like to ask you if anybody of you have some experiences uh, about the glaucoma. The eating, ingesting the oil can help with eye issues, including glaucoma, very nicely. Sometimes it clears completely, sometimes it controls it and makes it, makes it tolerable. Uh, I think a, uh, some people vaporize it for acute conditions, even for their eye, when the pressure gets too high, etc. So vaporization would be one way to go. I think topical use 
like three centimeters under the eye, uh, a combination of cannabis oil, frankincense, and myrrh, that could help very much because that way you could get the substances very near the problem, but you would not be putting it directly in the eye. The, uh, some people try to use cannabis drip, eye drips for glaucoma. That works nicely too. But the problem is that THC burns very badly when it gets in your eyes. It's very <laughs> not pleasant. Yeah? It's, you, you go like this and, and the eye uh, will cry for two hours. So that, that's not really ideal. So for glaucoma, I would recommend eating the oil topical here and then I would use it in suppositories and vaporize for acute problems and mood control. Uh, some other questions? Já se obávám, že bohužel už nám vypršel čas. Tak ještě jednu, jednu tak otázku. Poslední rychlá poslední. otázka. some experience with the SLA, SLA, no, SLE, SLE, says the gentleman. Are you asking about scleroderma? Scleroderma? What do you SLS scleroderma, failure of, the, of immunity, the cells, um, so to say, fight uh, the immunity system. Autoimmune uh, diseases, when the cells uh, respond uh, uh, too strongly. Um, the yeah, l cannabis is very effective for lupus. Yeah, oh. it, it works well. Stay away from alcohol, don't drink any alcohol. Stay away from the sugars, do a ketogenic diet, take the fat-burning supplements, and use cannabis. All of those things will shift you into being normal. <laughs> okay, so we finished our round table, our session. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your questions, and have a nice evening.